This is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is a forward for season six, episode one of the Chris Abraham show. I forgot to read the quote that I wanted to to make the baseline of this entire episode, which is I support and love and adore wokeness because it allows you to go enter into business, friendships, love affairs and marriages with so much more honesty, uh, not based on I mean, you're still when you when you go on a date with someone. Someone is still going to try to appeal to you, <clears throat> but because of wokeness, you can go into their social media or anything or their general world, and you can find out exactly who they are before you engage with them. And wokeness will actually prevent the issue that a lot of women who were on, you know, a lot of unhappy married women who would suffer and take Xanax for 20 years because they were caught in these trad marriages and there were these trad wives where trad means tragic not traditional and they would hate their lives and they would hate being wives and their husbands never knew who they really were and that they might be intolerant to this kind of chattel culture this kind of of uh old-fashioned wife is property kind of traditional world that still exists. Marriage is still channel culture where a father owns a daughter and then transfers ownership to a husband. Um, and the quote that I wanted to include was Maya Angelou, because you can't, you can't be a good podcaster talking about wokeness without talking about Maya Angelou. Um, Maya Angelou once said, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time and uh, take them at their word, man. When you meet someone and they low key have a lot of like X slash Twitter postings about, you know, screw the patriarchy, screw capitalism, uh, fight the power, um, men suck, mansplain, all that kind of other stuff. Like, that's really good to know, right? You, you know where you are. You're going to be hobbled and handicapped right away with the fact that um, this person considers you. Um, a monster. They might marry you because you're rich or because you have reputation or because you might be a good father or not. But if you can never clutch any kind of control over, like, I'll go into this, you know, like, I believe that a partnership should be two people submitting themselves and being submissive to each other. And if you are already the enemy, even though they're willing to date you or move in with you or marry you or whatever, if they've been known to signify that they hate you and everything that represent that you represent well ahead of time don't think it's a phase just assume that they might be willing to subvert it over time in order to catch you so that's all i wanted to say before the thing started if someone tells you who they are uh believe them and i believe that the best thing that wokeness ever gave to us was an honesty of signifiers an honesty of signification and uh, they are warnings for everybody in the same way that people believe that the signifier of a red hat, a red baseball cap or uh, an American flag or a um, don't tread on me uh, moral patch or um, any other type of signifier that uh, represents you as a conservative or a chad or a douchebag or, you know, a tech bro or a misogynist or a patriot or a fascist or a Nazi, like it goes both ways, right? So like, you know, blue hair or septum ring or a uh, nose piercing or uh, ear lobe spacers or, you know, any and all sundry things. These are all signifiers that are, they are not just fashionable. Like let the tattoos tell the story. Let the footwear tell the story. Let the clothing tell the story let your body count let your belief let your 
place on the spectrum of whether you're lefty, righty, whether you're into plant medicine, whether you're populist, whether you're libertarian, whether you're libertine, uh, you know, uh, you meet, you meet, uh, you meet ni nice Christian girls at church. You don't meet them at the club, right? You, uh, who knows who you're going to meet at the farmer's market. I meet the most amazing people at Park Run. Delightful, lovely, sweet, charming, amazing people. Uh, but, you know, believe them when they tell you who they are. If they say they're not interested in anything serious, believe them. If they say, I've already had my children, I'm not interested in having any more, believe them. If they say they don't want to have children, believe them, right? They might change who they are, but that's an honesty that they can have when they signify some other way down the road. For example, one of the love of, loves of my life, uh, Michelle Nolan, when I may, met her, she was a, a hot library grad student. She wore uh, big chunky jeans. She wore logger boots. She wore uh, what are they called jock bras, exposed belly, bobbed hair. She was cool at UH Manoa library degree from San Francisco and we started dating and she moved here and she became uh on her own I hope it wasn't for me but she became um Martha Stewart right so she became Martha Stewart on her own I hope I think <clears throat> and at that point in her life she was Martha Stewart I believed her she made food we went to church together like this was part of her but, like, I didn't have to make her that way, right? I was perfectly happy with the chick in the lager boots and with the bare belly and the, you know, the boxy uh, low-rise jeans and the black uh, jock bra and the bobbed hair and the, and you know, the baseball cap and the, um, come on, move it, move it, move it, um, and the sunglasses and the big chunky Seiko on her wrist, the super huge dive watch on her wrist. Uh, that drove me crazy. A girl, a girl with an oversized uh, uh, tool dive watch, mechanical tool dive watch on her wrist is is to dive for. Anyway, so this is the forward. And if you think this is a long forward, you should see how long the episode is. This is season six, episode one of the Chris Abraham show. I'm back. Hey there. This is season six, episode one of the Chris Abraham show. I haven't uh, dropped an episode since September 6th, so I'm going to restart a new season because 6'3 is my lucky number. It's my height, 6'3. It was my, um, my handle when I was a bike courier. And in the same way that uh, the producers of No Agenda always check out 33 and my friend... Willow and my dad, rest in peace, always noticed when it was 11-11. E-E-E-E. -e -e -e. I, um, I am, the, the major god wings I get are based on the number 63. So I thought I would just do the season up to 63 and then start off new. I have been sick since, uh, I've been sick since, uh, the 4th of September and, um, tried to power through it and finally my one of my clients my dearly lovely client from Ithic, uh sylvia went ahead and i told her i said you need to send me to uh the clinic you need to tell me i don't have a mom i don't have a daughter i don't have a mother uh which i just said i don't have a wife i do not have a significant other and i don't have an active aunt in my life or aunt so you're gonna have to tell me to go to the clinic and she did, and I thought I was going to an iNova one, but I went to an, one called Nova Health in Crystal City slash Pentagon City, and I was seen by a lovely, I think, nursing student, nurse, and then a uh, nurse practitioner, and they did a great job. Um, hopefully, my voice doesn't sound so weird. Hopefully, I don't cough too much. Hopefully, I don't snip and sneeze too much. Today is warm, but it's mostly cloudy and it's very windy. So I thank sweet baby infant Jesus for Adobe uh, sound cleaner, AI sound cleaner or whatever. Um, because today's episode is an episode I've been thinking about a lot and one that I've wanted to do. 
And it is um, about the fact that I am not only pro-woke, but I'm ex so excited about wokeness. Firstly, for selfish reasons, um, I studied postmodernism in 1990, uh, 1991, 1992, and 1993. I, stu I studied Jacques Derrida. I studied Alain Zixou. I studied uh, the Black Arts Movement. I studied post-war literary theory. I studied um, um, uh, Deleuze. I studied um, um, all the all the gangs, man, and uh, and it was awesome, right? I I always believed that there's nothing beyond the text. I also I always believed uh, in this uh, cons. And and secondly, I actually very deeply am uh, probably as mad as Philip K. Dick because I too believe that we live in a simulation. Uh, basically an MMORPG and, um, periodically there's, uh, um, what are called wipes, right? So, um, I think in Ultima Online or Ultima or whatever, there's things called shards. Um, they're also called servers or whatever. And I know that periodically, uh, they get reset, restarted and on the entire time an MMOR MMORPG is going, uh, they are making uh, patches, updates, and so forth. So that explains uh, the Mandela effect for me. That explains just about everything. I, I personally really and truly believe that we live in a sim. Um, I know, I've known we've lived in a sim, sim since uh, 1997 when I took a philosophy class at Chaminade University. And the only way that René Descartes could uh figure out that he wasn't um a thinking thing who uh whose entire life is the manifestation of an evil genius is because he had to take the giant step and the giant leap that uh god is love and a god would not subject him to such uh madness so ergo because god is love and we ha we uh live under a loving god we live in a world full of people. We live in a world full of delightful people and other people. And we live in a world with people who love us and people who care for us. And we live in a world where you generally don't have to shoot people in the head. Um, we'll see if I have to uh, total somebody because there's a madman about uh, 30 yards away, 20 yards away, yelling at people. And we'll see that if he will see if he targets me or not. He tends to stay away from me because I think I look, I look about as sane as Philip K. Dick. Okay, so secondly, I uh, love, I love wokeness for a second reason, which is for everybody who's ever been divorced, right? Um, I love wokeness because my mom wouldn't have had to have been in a 18-year marriage with my dad, and my dad wouldn't have had to have been in a 18 year marriage with my mom and all the arguments about married women who are on Valium and the men who married them. I know that I know that we like to give all the credit to the women for being abused by terrible men. But we also must say that uh, if men knew how unhappy their wives would be and how unsatisfied their wives would be with being chattel in a chattel cult worship, which is what marriage is. And if they would be obligated not to a LLP or an LP, a limited liability or limited partnership, but that they would be held under chattel law and they would be a possession of their husband as given to their husband by their father as property. Um, it's better to know what you're getting into before you get into it and what your expectations are. And with wokeness, plus with social media um, and general human empowerment, everybody's an individual. I don't know how we're going to fit everybody as an individual into the world of, of, uh, of, of socialism or communism, where everybody needs to seed, C-E-D-E, seed their uh, individuality to a larger uh, group. But we'll see how that goes. Everybody is Che Guevara. Uh, in their image of what their socialist Soviet 
communist utopia is going to look like. They're never the person working in the factory. So on on uh, my Macedon instance, I'm always saying silly things like I'm taking photos of uh, quote unquote woke women who have uh, septum piercings and lip piercings and eyebrow piercings and eyebrow shavings and and blue hair and green hair and red hair and have face tattoos and have body tattoos and have um, spacers in their ears and have uh, other sundry um, adornments on their face. And I like to also post uh, what are called, you know, dart frogs or poisonous tree frogs or um, Amazonian poisonous dart frogs. If you search for Amazonian poisonous dart frog, you will be gifted by seeing a a huge manifestation of the most garish and beautiful skinny little bug-eyed tree frogs that you've ever seen with big suction cup toes and um and just glistening bodies bodies glistening with the most noxious toxic deadly poisons known to man the reason why they're called dart frogs is because the native indigenous people would coat their blowgun darts with the uh with the i guess the phlegm or the the uh body fluid of these uh frogs and uh with the, the body fluid of these fro- frogs and you could take down you know you could take down varmints you could take down prey you can even take down your enemies so i like posting uh pictures of extremely living out loud people like i'm not even going to call them women like i'm just going to say cuz i i love i love the lgbtqia I especially love the two spirit and I'm a, I'm a, I, I'm a, um, I've loved, uh, Mahu culture since I was a, uh, a tween in, in Hawaii, ne, going to the beautiful, um, uh, parades, uh, and seeing these glamorous, heavy set, gorgeous women on Palominos be dazzled with the most beautiful colonial royal Kingdom of Hawaii, like dresses in, in pearl and rouge and royal blue and made out of satin or 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 um or uh, any number of beautiful fabrics and taffetas and and of course uh, silk <coughs> ten thousand dollar gowns back when ten thousand dollars is uh, today's hundred thousand dollars just beautiful pageantry I love it I've always loved it so. But if this were 50 years ago, if this were 60, 70 years ago, if this were the 1950s, uh, all those people who have now come out as non-binary or gay or lesbians or trans or um, who come out as whatever, um, even who come out as like, even if not lesbian, but part of the lesbian continuum and really down on marriage or down on men or even just bona fide men haters or people who think that it's an insult to have to cook or it's an insult to have to keep house or it's an insult to stay at home or it's an insult to to serve and honor your spouse right i'm um i'm christian enough i'm enough of a follower of of, of Jesus, a follower of the Christ, that I believe that a marriage is uh, an important sacrament and that there's a big difference between civil marriage and religious marriage. And I don't think there's any moral obligation in a civil marriage. I believe that it's a contract like any other. You, you're not, there's no expectation of needing to make children or even copulate or even see each other naked technically speaking you could marry a girl or a boy and be um asexual and be married and be a good partner to each other as roommates and have all the benefits the death benefits and so forth of being a married person but when it comes to a religious wedding or 
a wedding of the heart, not a wedding of contracts. I think it benefits you even pre-marriage. It benefits you dating. It benefits you so much. Um, you know, uh, there's a trope, right? There's a trope of a boy or a girl holding in his gut or doing the moral, ethical, sexual, uh, cleanliness, um, organization, like doing all the things that you do only so long as you land your man or woman, right? And um, there's even a trope where the girl's like, what are you going to do now that you're married? And the tropey McTrope face responses get fat, right? So now that we're all encouraged to be body positive and sex positive and open and transparent and overly share and overly talk and, and be the person that most men and women that I know do not realize until they're 40 and that's like, let's say there's a bell curve, right? Very few figure their stuff out in their 30s. A few more figure their stuff out in their 40s. A few more, a lot more figure their, themselves out in their 50s. But a lot of them don't get their courage until their 60s or 70s. There's a lot of people who come out of the closet in the past, right? There's a lot of really old queens who haven't come out until much later in life. Or people who stay on the DL or people who um, uh, have a secret life, the life of their desire versus the life of their... Uh, and this bifurcation is really what wokeism is doing. It's not, in my humble opinion, it's not making people... It's not, um, it's not programming people to be crazy... It's giving them the false sense of security that being crazy out loud is remotely safe. And by remotely safe, it means that if someone recognizes you as a dart frog and they're looking to tip their darts, that's fine. You know, that's kind of what you're built for. But if you're looking for a mate and that mate isn't looking for a dart frog... You need to wait until someone who's looking for a dart frog, someone who's willing to take a chance on a dart frog, dark fro dart frog, and even all the dark dart frogs around you might not be into being with a dart frog, right? It might be one of those things where a conservative man always ends up marrying a liberal woman or a, like me, like, I don't think I've ever dated anybody except maybe Liz Humphreys and maybe... Maybe Ruth Livermore, maybe Karen Chalupsky, maybe the Karen from Swim Team, Karen Van Eerden, Van Eerden, Van. But aside from that, like Stephanie was, I don't know, like was she five foot, five foot one, five foot two, five foot three? No, she was definitely not five foot three. She was, I think, probably five feet. Um, uh, Michelle Nolan was five feet. Uh, Wendy Gottlieb was 5'4". Uh, um, Betsy was 5'4". Um, I don't know, like, and I'm 6'3". Like, I'm a, I'm a tall guy. I'm a big guy, right? So, like, that's so traditional, right? Like, tall guys, and I make this joke with Mark. I say, tall guys, extremely tall guys know um, what extremely short women know, which is if you're too tall... You're going to be like a, a big dog and you're going to get hip dysplasia. You're going to get bad knees. You're going to die young. Um, little women know that they're going to be defenseless because they're five feet tall and 80 pounds, 110 pounds, maybe. Um, you know, five foot 10, five foot 11, maybe six feet, maybe five, nine. Uh, that's a good, you know, as long as you're like a 40 regular, if you're a 40 regular or a 40 tall, you will fit in all the cars you want. You will fit in all the planes you want to. You'll fit in everybody's uh, um, uh, weight tolerances. You'll you'll fit in 99% uh, uh, of all available shoes and available clothing. You can buy clothes in just about any country you want. You're a 40 regular. But if you're a 50 long, uh, 
you need to, uh, you know, and my shoe is size 14, right? Like that is the, that is the edge of the bubble. Like that is the edge of the bubble right there. So my point is, is the more, the, if you're open and honest and truthful, you can, uh, get someone, you can probably profess a <coughs> lifetime of love with, right? But for example, I just had the weirdest chat with Stephanie yesterday, uh, on, uh, on Facebook messenger, right? I professed that what she deserved is to be loved, to be cared for. She deserved to feel safe. She deserved to feel appreciated. She deserved to feel respected. She re deserved all those things. And I fucked everything up. And, you know, I'm sure I gave double heapings of those in the beginning. But um, something wasn't right. And after this amazing, she gave me one of those hearts that you do when you hold down your finger on uh, a chat bubble and it gives you a choice of things, right? Instead of committing to words, you commit to an attached heart. She gave me one of those red hearts and I'm like, all right, well, I'm processed. I'm perfectly, uh, I'm perfectly like I've got closure. Like now I got to say that that's sort of been, uh, nagging at me. And 30 seconds later, I go back to, uh, messenger and, um, chat rescinded or whatever chat revoked or, or, you know, talk revoked or withdrawn or whatever the word is. Every single one of the conversations we had over the last, I was up at 3 a.m. because I'm getting over this cold and I'm trying to oversleep. So sometimes I'm not as sick as I think I am at the time. So I'll wake up in the middle of the day or the middle of the night. And I was up and I think she's in either Melbourne or, or maybe she, she says she's in Melbourne, which I think means that she's probably in, uh, she probably lives right near Glebe Road in, in uh, Sydney. <coughs> but, uh, but yeah, she weirded out, man. She And, and I sent her, I, I took a screen capture of that little bubble where I said what she deserved from me and that I couldn't give it to her. What she did say to me before she deleted everything is she said to me, um, I was talking to you, like, this is after I left. I left, my dad came to, I think he came to... He came to the East Coast and we jumped into my, I called her Gertrude, my 1981 or 1980 or 1982, uh, beautiful, we called it baby shit brown, but it was just regular brown, um, uh, Mercedes 300D, uh, ch uh chassis, I think is, is it C123 or 123 or something like that. Love that diesel car. Anyway, we jumped on it, we crossed the country, we put it into a shipping container, and we uh, shipped it to Hawaii, and I lived with him for six months or a year before, three months a year, I don't know, um, before I, uh, and uh, maybe that, that must have been when uh, Stephanie came out to visit me in Hawaii, and when we went to the Big Island, and and stayed together in that amazing A-frame that Mary Vandevin had. And, uh, but anyway, I never came home because after doing a General Motors, uh, four week, uh, well, it ended up being a month in Puerto Rico and Fajardo. Um, after that, my dad had a massive heart attack and died. We had a week left of the gig. And then instead of going to Cuba, like we had scheduled and arranged for and paid for, we, uh, I had to manifest all of my Spanish learning and I had to, um, sorry, I've got the hiccups now. I had to organize, uh, the, um, como dia, como dia. I had to organize the, um, uh, what's the term when you, uh, make ashes of someone's remains. And, uh, we did that. We all flew back together. Cremate. He wanted to be cremated. So I, I cremated him at a local, uh, a local, whatever you call it, crematorium. Spoke completely in Spanish. They didn't know any English. Got, got or did. Got the death certificate. So all my dad's death certificates are, are in Spanish. And uh, moved back to Hawaii and ended up holding on 
to the company too long. Mark came to help me figure things out. My mom uninvited to came because my dad was the love of her life, even though when I was 19, my dad told me, Chris, I'm sorry that I left you at 13. Um, your mom was crazy. Sorry I left you behind. I had to leave. Your mom was nuts. Sorry I left you with her. Thanks, Dad. <clears throat> so, uh, like, my mom, I think, is the first woke woman that I ever met. Like, I would feel like my mom was a second, first, second? She was a 1960s, 1970 feminist. And the entire time, uh, growing up as basically my only parent... She would always talk about everybody treating her like a slave. Everybody treats her like a slave. Every, like If everybody tells you that they treat you like a slave, then you're the problem, Mom. You're the problem. You need to realize that everybody gets treated like a slave, and everybody does their service, right? So when young people who don't understand the mystery of God or the mystery of Christ, the mystery of Jesus, don't realize that we're here on earth to be slaves to each other, to be in service of each other, to be, um, I hate to admit this, but when, uh, I think it was 1997 or 1998, I was a whippersnapper and I created a bumper sticker that was so heretical and so disrespectful. I'm sorry, Jesus, sweet baby, sweet baby, infant, sweet baby, infant Jesus. I apologize, but I, I printed a bumper sticker that said bottom for Jesus, bottom for Jesus. For you who don't know, in, uh, in, in, in same-sex communities, uh, there are, generally speaking, one person is top, one person is bottom. Um, other people call it dom sub, other people call it, I don't know, butch femme, like there's lots of different words for it, but when I was uh, when I was exploring very strongly, I was actually on the vestry of my of my Episcopal Church, uh, St. James's. When I was doing this uh, terrible thing, I came upon the idea that part of the marriage ceremony is to is to submit yourself to your partner and complete and utter submission to each other. Is it is is an essential part of the love relationship. You have to be bottom for each other, right? And and sometimes when I had a really good girlfriend, right, or I've seen really good relationships, um, people, you know, trade places, right? Like, it's not like um, my, my, God, I keep on forgetting her name. She's so beautiful and so smart. Elsh, Ilsh, Milsh, Ilsh, Elsh. Anyway, she's this beautiful Ethiopian girl from uh, from the from the coffee shop. And she really believes that in a marriage, a man, was it Chris Tucker or Chris Rock, who said that the most lonely person to be in a, in a family is the man, because everybody else has the opportunity to be weak and pathetic and sad and depressed and sick and tired and, and whiny and weak and terrible. But the man of the house always has to portray uh to be the solid rock of Gibraltar, right? This, uh, this idea. And, and I talked to her and her friends who are from Ethiopia, and they're all Ethiopian Christian Orthodox, which is really the only remaining real church. Uh, there's no concept of trading it out. It's not like, you know, when Betsy and I were together, according to this um, uh, theory, like it's always my place to be uh, the dominant uh, hero all the time. And I feel like this is a bad power structure. I believe in, even in the Catholic Church, even in the Christian Church, even under Jesus, there needs to be submission of the husband to the wife and the wife to the husband. And my mom's unwillingness to be submissive to anyone, she called herself independent, but the fact that she was built and that my entire time with her as a normalized feminist uh, second wave, first wave, I don't know, 60s, 70s feminist, um, she had no desire to submit or be submissive to anybody. Now, I consider being submissive and submitting to people not only a luxury but an honor. I think that the most beautiful point 
of the Christian calendar is on Maundy Thursday, which is the day before Good Friday during Holy Week. And there is a, at least in my St. James's Church, which is why, like, one of my great loves, like, I'm not even going to put a, uh, I'm not even going to put a, a, a label on it, but one of the loves of my life was Father Downing, Father Richard Dick Downing. And I feel like everybody in his church were madly in love with him. He was definitely one of the loves of my life. We didn't, we weren't intimate. We weren't, we weren't, we didn't date. We didn't have a love affair. But the kind of respect and awe and admiration and feelings of this is the um, manifestation. I, I am still convinced that even though he can be, when I became on the vestry, which is the board of directors, the um, uh, sanctum sanctorum of the, each particular church, when I became, when I had that role uh, in the church, it occurred to me that uh, that he's also a whiny little bitch, and he's passive aggressive, and he's snipey, and he's this and that. He's perfectly human. He can be, you know, like quite a bitch and a little bit of a shit and a little condescending and, you know, a real jerk sometimes. But when he was on and when he was with his flock and in his heart and in his sermon and uh, when the... Uh, when the pageantry of mass was on, he was the only person I've ever met who I can safely say is an ascended master. Uh, peace be upon him. He, he passed a few years ago. Um, but he was, uh, pretty amazing to me, pretty impressed by him. I, I feel like there's these peoples, these ascended masters all around us, peoples, there's these people all around us who you never know who they are, but a lot of them keep their head down and they just experience their ascended masterhood by themselves in relationship to uh, to God, goddess, and the other. But this man shared it with us. We went on retreats and everything, but um, the only reason I bring this up is because on Maundy Thursday every year, he would get on his knees and he would wash the feet of any and all congregants who desired to. He would wash our feet. He would towel our feet. He would anoint our feet in oil. And then he would, he would, he would finish cleaning our oiled feet and then send us on our way. That is the most intimate, the most beautiful, and the most visual, visual representation of uh, submission to another. And there was no way, in any way, and I had him wash my feet a few times, right? Like, I was there for a number of Maundy Thursdays, and, you know, I was a participant. And I believe that there were other people who washed feet. I feel like they're people from the vestry or people from uh, the uh, people who um, had other positions uh, in the... In the uh, Holy Week, I believe that if you wanted a woman to wash your feet, or if you're a woman and wanted a woman to wash your feet, I, I believe there was a number of choices, but there were, for lack of a better word, foot washing stations throughout the uh, main uh, hall of the, the main pews near the altar of this church. Um, St. James's, it's got a different name now, but it's on Capitol Hill, and it is a transcendent moment. You feel God, you feel uh, worshipped, you feel loved, and you better understand two things, like immediately. You understand what it felt like to be Jesus and have your feet washed by tears, by hair, and by oil. And you also knows what you know what it feels like to see a Christ-like person, a, an avatar for Jesus, kneeling before you the most respected senior member of the entire church community, the rector, Father Dick Downing, bloody Dick Downing, the man we all ha are madly in love with, the, 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 maybe the only man on some of our, uh, some of our uh, love of our lives list, right? And you see him on his knees in his, in his, and he is 
washing your feet, your bare feet, with his hands, and then toweling them, and then anointing them with oil, and then toweling them, and then giving you a blessing upon arrival and upon departure. And that kind of submission is what each partner in a relationship need to be willing to do. It's not the adored and the adoring. It's not the beloved and the uh, and uh, the the lover and the beloved. It's not um, the the you know. And I struggle with this, right? Because I'm coming out right now as a, as a voyeur, and now I understand the reason why I'm such a voyeur is because I've got this thing called aphantasia. Um, my friend uh, Min. Uh, who's an amazing, uh, uh, Min Lei, uh, amazing writer and, uh, and, and man and husband, uh, and a, an embodiment of a Christ figure. I, I feel like in the marriage between, uh, Amy Obendorfer Lei and Min Lei, I definitely believe that there's the marriage, the rare marriage of two ascended masters. Uh, but I see, both of them submit to each other, but also lead each other. I don't see whoever in that family does the foot washing and gets the foot washes. I don't see anyone always offering the shoulder rub and the person who's like, my hands are too small and too weak. I don't want to. I don't see an imbalanced relationship between them. I mean, I don't know, but I know that men keeps his eyes out all the time for uh for frac grenades to throw himself on he is endlessly selfless and um and it's amazing to watch him negotiate life uh as an aside the moment it got out that my mom was dead unexpected at uh um at uh, virginia hospital center before i knew it outside my window my mom's room uh min lay was there with his car to take me away and he drove me immediately to 8th Street. We had uh, some uh, gym, gin. My mom loved uh, gin. And uh, we had gin on the rocks with olives. And then he took me across the street to the military barber shop. And I got myself a mourner's haircut by having my head shaved. And uh, he spent the day with me. And uh, I do not believe that that was a selfish decision. I believe that that was something he would have done for anybody. And I don't believe that he was waiting uh, 11 years for me to honor him on this podcast. I believe that he doesn't hesitate. I believe it's not for love and glory. Um, he's the most modest mouth superhero I've ever seen. He is the embodiment of a man who would go out of his way to wash all the feet and nobody in the room would call him a pussy, a wimp, a wuss. After he washed everybody's feet, people would decide that he was, like, the biggest chat in the room. And I mean that as a positive thing. Like, he is he is a Sigma male. And I don't even know what that means. I'll have, uh, hey, um, chat GPT, please add into the glossary a big thing about what Sigma male is versus an alpha male, and a beta male. Thank you. Anyway, so my point is, and I've wiggled and waggled and wiggled and waggled, and I apologize for that, but my point is, is that submitting to others, being submissive to others, being weak around others, allowing other people to, other people to shine, allowing other people to, uh, to drive, allowing other people to lead in the dance of life, but always being willing to take over the um it's not infantilizing right you're not the only reason we treat children as generously as we do is because we're not threatened by them or because we know that they need to learn one of the nicest things and one of the saddest things that uh that uh stephanie austin said to me yesterday was that one of the i'll go i'll start with the good thing she said to me that being with me introduced her to so many new things and she learned so many new things and uh for those of you who don't know i spent from uh 10 years old to 33 years old being a professional stock photographer and a professional commercial photographer um 
and a professional travel photographer. And uh, one of the things that Stephanie told me she regrets is the fact that I never uh, taught her how to, I never taught her how to, how to shoot. I never taught her photography. I never took her under my wing. And I believe that's something that Michelle wanted. I believe that's something that I know Betsy asked me for and we never did. And I, I don't know if I'm selfish with it or I consider it not to be something I care that much about. Like, you know, what is it called? Um, uh, pearls to swine. I'm not saying any of these women are the swine. Uh, I mean the fact that I ha my photography, which is the pearls, I just don't have any value for, right? The women are beautiful, beautiful things. Like, I love these women I call men things, I call women things, I call, I, I don't mean that to be um, the objectification of people. I meant to say they're beautiful, beautiful people. I don't mean, but I was making the imagistic comparison to pearls. So pearls being a thing, I was making that comparison, but I did not mean in any way that I was objectifying them. Although as a voyeur, I objectify everybody. So... I want you to know that I objectify you every time I see you. I scrutinize every detail. I look way too long. I probably creep you out. I don't intend to. But what I'm doing is I'm indexing you. I'm doing, you know, like when you have one of those um, scanner beds or whatever at or um, any kind of laser scanner or, or uh, you know, four in one uh, printer scanner or, you know, back in the day where we had card scanners. The analogy for my AFib is that I can't take a picture of you. If I want to get you onto the canvas of my mind, I literally need to make you sit for a, uh, for a canvas. I need to do the equivalent of that's the scanning heads and the reason why i did it so long is to give you an example of that's my dad said the reason why he can he transitioned from uh fine art i.e illustration and painting to photography is that he could make a painting in one twenty-fifth of a second. But uh, um, I even got it wrong. I, I indexed Michelle, sorry, I indexed uh, Stephanie Austin so well, I thought, right? I thought honey-colored hair. I remember the fact that she had uh, hair on her arms and her legs, but that they were super fine and also like that beautiful, like that kind of, pale blonde hair that you see maybe on uh, a peach. Uh, peach fuzz, I guess they call it peach fuzz for a reason. I remember um, that she had rounded hips and, and she had uh, round shoulders and I remember her nose and I remember her big, big eyes and I remember she told me she had honey-colored hair. I guess I called it strawberry blonde or I called it... Um, uh, surfer blonde or saw a picture of her now and it's sort of like blonde on top and dark under maybe sh um, dirty blonde she said she had honey colored hair I remember that that was part of the indexing and I indexed that she had hazel eyes but she told me that she had according to what she wear and according to her temperament like a mood ring moon rock she either has green or blue eyes so during the eh, 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 I had not adjusted um, color. I didn't. I didn't check my uh, palette. I didn't. I didn't make sure that uh, everything had uh, been properly uh, sorted out. But I think she used the word hazel. But she's got green or blue eyes, more blue than green, sort of thing. So now I've updated my index, but. The voyeurism is because I have to look at you to see you. I can't close my eyes and bring up a picture in my head. Um, when mean girls always say things like, take a picture, it'll last longer. That was one of the reasons why I was so good at being a photographer, because I can truly see what's in front of me. I'm a blank canvas. I'm not projecting images. I'm not hallucinating images. I'm not adapting images. 
I always do check some when I see someone again. I notice their hair. I notice details about them. The more attracted to you I am, the more I see you. But that's only human nature. Sorry to say. But yeah, voyeur. I'm a voyeur. Like, like one of my, uh, I guess my five kinks that Mark is completely aware of, and now you are, is that I love bobbed hair. I love, uh, I love, I'm happy with blunt bobs. I'm happy with bobs with uh, long bangs. I'm happy with bobs with uh, blunt bangs. I'm not happy with bobs with that get the hell away from me short bang thing. Mark says that, or, or maybe even David Cohen say that you can put, you can, uh, you can put a, a bob wig on a mop and I'd be attracted to the mop, which I think is quasi true because this absurd, um, woman uh who has been fired but who has been representing um ukraine for uh the propaganda pr public affairs thing you know the trans woman who has a really bad blonde bobbed wig on i gotta tell you like the bop does it for me man even with the sandy colored hair like you know nothing wrong with that but also even when I was in my 20s and 30s and the internet came on, I was strangely attracted to, you know, catching glimpses of women in what felt like private moments, like intimate moments, like like bodies that aren't like I'm attracted to human bodies that look like that they aren't designed to be on a stage. So no attraction to fitness models, no attraction to um, any type of body type that looks like it was designed to be wearing a bikini. I generally am not interested in. I'm not interested. I'm interested in a little bounce, a little jounce. Some, I love tan lines. I, you know, so uh, I guess I'm more attracted to inside bodies than outside bodies or, or, um, so I think that, you know, that has a lot to do with the way I see. And when it comes to mating rituals and so forth, uh, back to uh, representing the manifestation of wokeness is that I notice every... Oh, here's another thing I learned during my postmodernist world. I, I studied a lot. I studied film theory in England. I studied film theory in, in the U.S., I'm an expert in the male gaze. I understand the male gaze. I understand the female gaze. G-A-Z-E, G-A-Z-E. -E. Um, I definitely have a male gaze. It's, uh, it's appallingly male. Um, and based on that, um, I think it's really important. One of the words and the concepts that we talk about in postmodernist theory and deconstructionist theory, especially deconstructionism, and in literature, I studied American literature, creative writing. I studied uh, African-American literary theory and black uh, literary theory. Um, it's actually Marxist feminist theory. And uh, one of the important things that we talk about in gay studies and in feminist studies is the idea of signifiers and the signify, right? So I look at all of these dart frog signifiers as important signifiers. I was talking to a young, super attractive, super, the guy has the best hair I've ever seen, couple at Idito's yesterday. And we were talking about, you know, she's like recently, she's like, um, recently, like, um, uh, um, uh, como di, uh, 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 doc, Dr. Martin boots were only for like diesel dykes. Like it, the, and that was her words, quote unquote diesel dykes, or it was really just a, it was it was as much of a signifier to the lesbian community, she said, quote unquote, as the Subaru has been for 20 years. She said, not that, you know, rock climbing dudes, and that's a type, rock climbing dudes. Andrew Curry's a rock climbing dude. Um, definitely uh, Ramon Frey is a rock climbing dude. Rock climbing dudes who tend to be extremely liberal, uh, pretty woke themselves rock climbing dudes are not the kind of woke that only do it to get laid there they actually are ideologically compatible with that world which i respect but it's not while subarus are certainly signifiers of rock climbing dudes they have been in the past recent past 
pretty much owned by the lesbian community. And so now I know that I can start looking for those signifiers, right? Like I don't want to bark up the wrong tree. I'm not dating. I'm not looking to date or whatever, but I like to know before I give, I look, I, I very look very carefully for any signifiers that I need to choose special pronouns or I need to ask about pronouns or I need to use a certain type of language or patter or I need to hold my body in a certain way, or I need to bring up a certain topic or stay away from a certain topic. Um, and so I, I itemize and, uh, and index all signifiers before I even try to engage or decide not to. So for me, wokeness is amazing because I don't, there's no secrets. And the biggest reason why that bothered me, oh, the thing that, that Stephanie said to me she said, she's like, um, when you, I told you I moved to Hawaii and I left her behind. We were very much in love, but I was too overwhelmed by my mom and her. Like there was just too much, like really aggressive women energy in my life. And I needed to fuck off. I needed to get the fuck out of there. Like maybe if my mom had stayed in Florida, uh, Stephanie and I would still be together. But she said to me, she's like, I didn't understand you. I would talk to your mom. Your mom would want to talk to me. We'd talk like I just didn't know what the hell was going on. I couldn't understand you. You know, you're a volatile, erratic and all these other things like and then I was so sad for the couple next to us in our courthouse studio like we were always fighting and all this other kind of stuff. And uh, after chatting with her and then all of a sudden she revokes all of her chats and then disappears and then she kills the entire Stephanie Austin account that she had had she's got a married name now oh also she never shares anything about her i don't know if she's in melbourne or sydney i don't know if she lives in connecticut again i don't know if she lives in europe based on the time zone she either lives in europe or melbourne or sydney or new south wales somewhere i know she has a daughter who i'm pretty sure is probably in college or out of college already i don't know if she has a husband i know she married someone right after me I don't know if it's her first husband or second husband or third husband. I don't know where she lives. I don't have her phone number. I don't have her address. I don't have her real email. I have um, I have emails that are only for me. To the point where she said in the chat, I promise to you I'm not a Polish spy. But that doesn't mean she's not a, an American spy. I think the girl's a spy. I definitely know that she uh, worked for Population Action International. So maybe she's the queen of depopulation. Maybe she works for the World Economic Forum. Maybe she's chums with, uh, what's his name? Uh, the creepy guy with the, um, with the German name uh, who sounds like a James Bond villain. Anyway, so she's like, yeah, I couldn't figure you out. Dude, I couldn't figure you out, man. Like, I can't figure you out now. I don't know where you are, what you do, what your job is, what your married name is what your if you have a husband if you're divorced if you're separated if you were a single mom if you're rich if you're poor if you went to grad school i don't know if she went to grad school i don't know if she's got a phd she might maybe she's a yoga instructor maybe 10 years ago she told me she was a yoga instructor i know she looks exactly the same like if you took you know how like <coughs> in cinema they take a young hot girl and then they just like add a couple lines to her forehead and they're like, okay, now she's 50. <clears throat> she looks exactly like, uh, you know, 21 year old Stephanie Austin, but as if she maybe spent 10, 15 minutes with a, uh, a stage makeup artist and they added like a cut, like they added a few um, uh, crow's feet to her eyes and like a little Y, a little, a little Y, um, crevice to between her eyes like on her brow and that's it everything is exactly the same she looks exactly the same she's got some crow's feet she's got a little y furrow on her brow and that's it she has the same eyes the same honey colored hair the same hair length this shit the same uh narrow shoulder a little bit hippie short curvy cute figure super cute figure anybody would say and um and from knowing her as a girl, she has uh, the kind of, you know, bosom and body that I believe uh, sustains all the way through 
through death, right? You're not dealing that much with too much gravity, you know, all these other things. I'm sure she looks like a million bucks. And that's the only thing I know about her is, uh, and now she torched the Facebook account and torched all the conversations. When I saw she did that, I revoked all of mine and only kept that one screenshot that said that what she deserves from me, what she deserved from me and what I couldn't give her. So I sent her an email. I'm like, what the hell? Are you okay? She said she was having her menzies and I'm suffering from this sickness. So we commiserated on that. So she's like, everything's fine. Um, but I got the answers to all the remaining niggling questions I had after our breakup in 2020 uh, in 1995. And so I decided that I could, you know, cut bait. And so, well, I'm like, that's fine because I feel completely sure that in all senses that I have complete closure with you. So Godspeed, good luck, goodbye. And I wish you well. And I wish you guys well. Love you a lot. This is season uh, six, episode one of the Chris Abraham show. And this one is a long one. So take your time. I'll talk to you soon. Lots of love, mahalo, and I'll see you on episode two of season six of The Chris Abraham Show. My name's Chris Abraham. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.